Mm-hmm. Hello, everybody. How are we doing today? Hello. Let's see. How are we all doing? Today is, of course, the 6th of January, and it is quirky classes and what they tell us about their navies, because primarily it's fun. And there's going to be a few other changes announced at the end of this video. There are. There are going to be a few little discussion points at the end of this video, because... don't know if you've noticed, but... There has been a lot of discussion being caused by the county class. And there's also a lot of discussion going on at the moment about the Type 83s. And as such, I've made a bit of a long-term plan for the year. So, I'm going to explain all that at the end. There we go. Right then. How are we doing, everyone? Let's uh, say hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, George Newman. Hello, Jess P. Hello. Hope you're all well. Jess P. I know there's no apostrophe in half its duties. No, there isn't. But there is in the slide I put up there. The reason I put up the little mistake was in case people decided to copy it. So I'd tell if they were copying me or not. That was just me being, you know, cruel. Hello, Colin Cameron. Hello, Ollie. Hello, hello, hello. I don't think I've seen you before, or have, have, have you changed your name since you were done last year? Hello, Rick Vasava. Hello, Knight Six Eight Three One. Was Adrian's hood re starting to reach the end of her life before she got sunk? Mm, not particularly. I wouldn't say she's particularly trying uh, starting to reach the end of her life. She's definitely in need of major upgrade, but that's more to do with the changing pace of time. Hello, Annette Roger Paul. Hello, M35 Benvids. Hello, Anuk. Uh, China, setting up a naval, a, naval, a naval base in Equatorial Guinea will end up on Biltrums, but my question on that I think are reasonable to ask. Yeah, probably reasonable to ask, not really for this particular live, but there are probably reasonable well questions. Uh, G.D. Harmon. Hey, dear Doc. Uh, from where the U.S. Navy ships were quirky as they could be a USS Michigan, the paddle wheel, iron hulled frigate or something, and uh, two paddle wheeled aircraft carriers. Wolverine and several. Well, Michigan almost made it. Didn't. Because there were other ships which had, uh, other navies which had paddle wheeled frigates. So, honestly, you can't really be that picky on calling a paddle wheeled frigate quirky. The Royal Navy had one, and well, had more than one. Uh, the French had a couple. You know, it, it, the thing is, paddle wheeled frigates, they might be quirky for us to look at, but at the time they're fairly common. And as for Wolverine and Sable, I decided not to go with those because of the second part of the question quirky classes and what they tell us about their navies. They really, all the, what Wolverine and Sable tell us is that the US Navy really wanted to train pilots as quickly as they freaking could without using up an active carrier and also losing pilots. Hello, Sean. Hello, Vision. Hello, Richard Author. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. I was almost on time and then, well, XSplit and YouTube decided to have a debate as to whether or not I could log in through them. We'll leave that to one side. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. Hello, DG40. Hello, hello Dep Squad. Hello, Jeff. Hey, uh, upper pedantic. So, I offer my apologies. No, nope. pedantic is uh, fine by me. I am often pedantic myself. After all, I have to mark people's work on occasion. And when you're trying to decide between whether someone gets a first, which is 70% or above, or a 2-1, which is between 60 and 70%, it often comes down to which is, you know, which has the le least mistakes, rather than which one is the best uh, is the best written. Hello, Felix B. Swiss Patrol Boats. Mm, tempting. I see Richards. The book is on the way. I'm glad it is. Um, hello, Mr. Wolf. Hello, Tana Perkia. Hello, Tommaso Balsoni. Hello, Tommaso Balsoni. 
Fine match to catch you live. Thank you. Time zones are annoying, yes. Evie F E Z six two eight oh. That's just trying to be cruel to me. Uh, I try once more to see if my guy actually answers explains anything at all. Hmm. Hello, the narrator. Hope you well. Thank you for the super chat. Hello, Dichen the Gavrik. Hello, George Newman. Hello, the Shrike six one six. Hello, Jean V. Hello, Graham Depsy. Thank you for catching me live. Hello, Malaga. Hello, Oli. Hello again, Oli. Indeed, it was a name change. Ah, good. <sighs> that's about that, that. That's that makes me feel slightly Ill, Ill, less cruel for just sort of noticing you now. If I if you'd been and I'd not noticed you, that would have made me feel bad. Hello, Jess. Oh, thank you, Jess P. No need to. I said no need to bother just being pan, a pedantic, and I said I am often am as well when I'm marking. Hello, Stafford. Ooh, that does sound like a busy day. Hello, Sage of Irrelevance. And ouch, Stafford, the list is going on. Hello, John Shea. Hello, oh, Zachary Kirkin. I think um, Jess P is referring to one of the slides I have that I use sometimes as video holder catch slides for when I'm po posting up lives and when I'm scheduling them, so things I put in so that they have an image rather than just being a blank space. Night 6 no, she wouldn't have been converted to an aircraft carrier. She'd have just, she'd have been rebuilt. Uh, by World War Two, you weren't really, unless you were Japan, you weren't really converting ships to aircraft carriers or to an extent, Italy. Even Germany was building their own and the British were certainly building their own carriers. But you can get a far more efficient ship if you build it from the scratcher, from the base up as an aircraft carrier, and if you have the space to build, you build. Because, honestly, it takes almost much materials. The only reason why you have Eagle, Furious, Courageous, and Glorious, and Argus, of course, serving for the time they're doing, and Vindictive, is because of the limitations when you build it by treaty or other things which cause them to be chosen. The Royal Navy would have much preferred to not have Courageous and Glorious and to have built the carriers. But the trouble is they'd probably built things which um probably weren't too do some of the Hermes, maybe slightly bigger. Hmm. Isaac Gurken. Just like, as I recently got a book on French warships in the Age of Steam, I wonder if you'll include any French vessels and which ones. Oh, there will be some French vessels in it. But um, I'm presuming it's this vessel, or this book, which I've got up here, which is written by Roberts. Which, if I quickly... This one here. And uh, that's going to be the basis of quite a few little videos coming up. Hello, this is June. I have a feeling that nobody likes the Hawkins. Why? Because they're light cruisers which are forced to do a heavy cruiser roll. <sighs> Narrator, last night me and my IC discussed in detail how bootstrapping the Royal Canadian Navy and Royal Navy would work if you decided to intervene with a time machine. Oh, there are so many things you'd do with a time machine. Take care, Sav. Let me get lunch. Hello, the Royal Router. Hello, and Seneca Nero. Hello. <sighs> Seneca Nero, would an aircraft carrier to battleship conversion be possible? And what would such a ship look like? Uh... It's possible, but... Basically, imagine a Lexington class as a battle cruiser. We'll be getting into the Lexington class in a bit, so we'll do that. Yes, it's milk. That's it. It's no iron, iron brews only on Sundays at the moment. So I've got all the bottles for Sunday stored down here. And we have taken delivery of, well, Espedus Pope. Both me and my sister were, to were told we didn't have any, well, no. How to put it? I asked my sister this morning, she said, oh, we don't have any milk in the house, and it's we, uh, I can't get any older. So I ordered some. So I got 16 pints delivered. 
And then Tesco's turned up this evening, and they, lo and behold, they've also brought 16 pints. So we now have 32 pints, plus we had this bottle still in there, which needed to be drunk and finished off. So basically, I'm drinking milk to save the fridge. It helps. Okay. Sage of Reverence, our Japanese submarine aircraft carries are uh, quirky. Well, this is what we're starting off with quirky, as in the Fa di Bruno, which is basically the Italian Navy saw the Royal Navy's monitors and went, oh, we want something like that. And then they forgot they were Italian. And they built this. Because... I don't know about any of you, but I have honestly never seen a less Italian-looking ship. It's not. Mm. Germans, courageous, glorious, and furious were only built to keep the Germans awake at night worrying about the Baltic. It worked. Grand Dancy, so I'm running a war game with one six thousandth scale of the Falklands conflict. Which ships do you think would change things most? A four carrier task force of Ark Royal, Eagle, Hermes, and uh, Eagle and Hermes, uh, uh, Eagle and Hermes, and an Eagle, or something, or two refitted Dinwalters or two CVA ones. Um. Well, CVA ones have been brand new. But I think, honestly, you'd probably be better off with the refitted Malters. And I have a reason for that, in that if you've had the refitted Malters, you probably haven't had the whole scenario with Victorious. So you probably built the Malters, which means you probably have a uniform Malta 4 of Malta, squad, of Malta fleet of carriers. Including whichever vessels named Dark Royal is probably Malta and etc. And they are more than likely the corners a, a fairly a fairly worked up, fairly competent force. Hmm. Zakirin, I got it as a Christmas gift to myself. Glad I know I got a hopefully useful book on French vessels with it. Also, would you recommend any books by any other books by Stephen Roberts? Um, of the three I've got, I haven't got any problems with any of them, so I'd say all of them are pretty good. It depends if you're interested in the topic. They're good. They're good books. There is kind of like Norman Freeman, but slightly more mm, artistic. I would put it as, whereas Norman Freeman's slightly more sciencey engineering. Hmm. Second, we have now three fridges in the house. Well, I have a second fridge which is ready to go in down here, but hasn't gone in yet because we've been doing a whole argument VDF over power usage, and I thought plugging in another fridge would probably win them the argument. Now, this is, as said, the Fa de Bruno, and it's an Italian monitor. It is built by the Venetian Arsenale, who build very beautiful ships. It's built during World War I. It's completed in 1917. It played a role in the Battle of Isonzo, and is finally decommissioned theoretically in 1924, but becomes floating battery GM-194 at the beginning of World War II and was towed to Genoa, where she spent the rest of the war. Um, how do I describe her? Well, she's 2,900 tons in standard. She has a length of 55.56 meters, a beam of 27 meters, so she's pretty much a rectangle. She has a draft of 2.24 meters. She has a single boiler, 
and 465 indicated horsepower, which means she has less than some modern cars do. Uh, this powered two shafts via two triple expansion steam engines. We can be worried about the fact that she only needed one boiler to power two engines. Uh, she had a top speed of 3.31 knots. I'm fairly sure that's with a lot of luck and a tailwind. Uh, a complement of 45. She's armed with a pair of 15-inch guns. That's twin 15-inch forwards. Uh, four single 3-inch AA guns. And two single 40mm AA guns. She has 40 millimeters of deck armor, 110 millimeters of turret armor, and a 60 millimeter barbette. Her hull had a concrete coffer dam, nearly three meters thick, that was strapped to her hull. And uh, yeah, th this is this ship is. It, the pictures from the front are even more interesting if I um just pull that up. I went for the rear picture because, frankly, I was trying to torture you all. Ba -ba -da -ba. There we go. Yep, this is what she looks like from the front. If any of you think that's an improvement, I'm going to be worried about your eyesight. Tommaso Balconi. Uh, the fact that I like Furious in a very odd configuration probably tells me more about me liking Quirky stuff than about her own quirkiness, probably. Yeah, the, 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 the trouble with having HMS Furious in here as a quirky ship, it would be that... She would be the in uh, her various forms are all quirky. Joe Scott, are you going to look at a circular lot later? Mm, no, but probably in another video at some point. Okay, let's see. <laughs> so, okay, that ship doesn't look like a ship from any nation. It looks like something nobody would uh, pick, something nobody would pick up with the loss of the valve. Yeah, it's that th there is a barge with a lot of turret. I mean, there are some various issues. Uh you meant victorious. Uh, that makes more sense. Uh if de Bruno. Ah, they modeled it after a fortified Croatian island they captured in nineteen eighteen. I have no idea what they mod mod they modelled it on, but frankly, it was sunk by the Royal Navy in World War Two. We'll leave it at that. <sighs> Ali Al, can it be said that it's floating or just not sinking yet? Well, I wouldn't. Let's put it this way: even in the Mediterranean, I would be not that keen on taking it out into the water. I'm surprised it actually went round Italy rather than just spending its life in the Adriatic. So, okay, would a Malta be called Queen Elizabeth II because it, she might be crowned near the launch of the last? Potentially. Potentially. Now, the Italians, well, they have a second entry in tonight's fun, which is the Grillo class. Now, the Grillo class. How do I describe them? Well, they're technically termed as tracked torpedo motorboats. And they're designed, uh, they're developed because whilst the naval blockade had managed to force the Austro-Hungarian Navy to keep their principal uh, vessels very close to their bases in the Adriatic Sea. And wishing to avoid the risky, well, basically numerical superiority of the Italian battle fleet supported by the French if they could actually get going that day, and the British if they felt like turning up with anything.
basically, the Italians decided they wanted to attack, do a torpedo at boat attack on Pola after they'd done a successful one on Trieste. And that's uh, Pula in modern Croatia. And so they designed these. Top speed of four knots, capable of taking two 18 inch aircraft type torpedoes, displacing eight tons with a length of 16 meters, a beam of three meters, and a draft of 0.7 meters, with the installed power of 10 horsepower. Now, for those who are not quite sure what 10 horsepower equates to, let me say this. My first car was a Vauxhall Astra Merit Estate. L813 VHR, I think her um, number plate was, from memory. And she was lovely. But brand new, she had had all of 97 brake horsepower. That was brand new. I'm fairly certain by the time I got her, she was down to her 70s. So they make six of make four of these vessels, and not even their combined horsepower comes to the level of my very old first car. Mm -hmm. John Evans, a brew fridge, yes. I've got a fridge from my office, so literally for that. Hello, Yikers. Hello, Mark Powerframe. Hello, Mitch Lotes. George Newman, three and a half knots going downstream with tailwind. Um, Juicy, I'm fairly sure that actually, if you added sails to the far, uh, it would have been got faster. Hmm. Ah, the far de Bruno. How far behind him? <laughs> right. <clears throat> now, Nancy Roy, I'm here now back to driving a pizza. <laughs> oh. You're driving for pizza, you don't just get it delivered. It seems far too much effort. Uh, narrator, it looks like one of the ships I built in in FTD when under emergency. Hmm. Now, I should add, these literally, those are tracks. And the idea was sandbanks, etc., they could just pull themselves over. And then they could mount an attack. So they could get round things like chains and other obstacles put across the various waterways by literally going around them over the, the land. Um, if anyone wants to take a torpedo boat on land, I'm, I'm, and it doesn't have a machine gun on or anything on it, so... Hello, Night Hammer Productions. New IP 4472. So the Italians made a floating breeze block. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure. The Father Bruno it, it was actually. I'm not sure if they were actually even fighting when they sank the um, 
started Bruno. I think they just sank it for, bro uh, for on grounds of it was it was disturbing to Ron Eddie shipping. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, conveyor belts on floats that works. Nice. What were the Italians smoking when they designed that? Which one? The Giglio class or the Fa de Bruno? Yeah, both of them have an interesting... Let's... How do I put it politely? They had ideas, right? It, it, it's one of those scenarios where you can just imagine the conversation. Everyone is gathered round a huge bowl of pasta, dishing it out, going... We must. We have done this great attack on Trieste. We, we must try and figure out a way to get in the polar. And they're looking at the latest pictures from the front, and they're going, "What we need is a tank." Well, we can't get a tank across the water, <gasps> but can we? Let's design a motor, tor a motor torpedo boat tank. Now. I would like you to think that I, I think what happens when the people designing the LVT in World War Two are thinking, hmm, we need a landing vehicle that's going to drive off on its own. I think they look back in this and thought, that tells us a lot. Look at that shape. Oh, yeah, at least the Grillo design have a specific design that needs to look like that. True. But it also shows us that the Italians themselves have decided that... Well, here's the thing. Listen, they're using aircraft torpedoes on these things. And at no point is it, uh, they're not sort of thinking, well, why don't we just pump out some more aircraft and do an aircraft or aerial torpedo attack on the harbour? No, we're going to try it this way. Hmm. Mitchellites, my riding lawnmower has a 13 horsepower engine. Well, you'll be glad to know you've got more horsepower in that engine in your riding lawnmower than one of these had. You could give them a speed increase if you were willing to donate your engine. Mitchellites. Again, basically, if you know, a, a few people donated their thirteen uh, their thirteen horsepower engine. They could get a lot faster. Go on, four knots. So if the tides are against you, go go backwards. If the tides are against you, you could go anywhere. And in the Shomak, didn't the right flyer have more horsepower than the Grillers? Possibly. I haven't looked it up. The narrator, don't sales stop being effective about 10 to 15 knots. Mm, they can get you up that high. <laughs> Although, well, as narrator, as um, G. Sujan pointed out, American Cup yachts can go a little bit faster. But they're kind of extreme sailing machines. <laughs> oh, that room. Uh, that's good. Are the enemy ships expected to sit quietly and watch the obvious TV torpedo launching thing crawling slowly out of the water and next to the torpedo units? I, I presume their plan was to attack at night. How about Jonathan Burrow? I, I presume. They did try it a few times. Don Cameron, also the same shape as the duck. Yep.
so the X1. And, well, there's a very good book about the X1, which I've got. So I'm just going to grab that book quickly. Because if you're lucky enough to have it, you might as well use it. <laughs> Written by Roger Bruntill Cook. It's a very fine book. Um, it has all the schematics and the pictures and the various things in that you would expect. And it gives you a lot of interesting information about the X1. And it's pretty much the only cure book about the X1 you can get. Now, why have I put the X1 in here? Because... At some point, the Royal Navy decided to come with a submersible commerce radar. Now, you're going to sit there and go, hang on, why does the Royal Navy need a submersible commerce radar? Well, the Royal Navy was looking at it for two reasons. One, if you're going to work out how to counter this idea, you better have one yourself so you can test it out and see whether it works. Two, you're talking about the Pacific again. They don't need a submersible commerce radar for dealing with America. Why don't they need a submersible commerce radar for dealing with America? Because if you're fighting America on the other side of the Atlantic, then most of their trade from South America has to go through the Caribbean, where you have bases and can put a naval fleet. Most of their, uh, most of their trade from Europe is going to go through ports, which either are British ports already, or mean they have to go through the Channel or round the, around the UK and Sea. Again, you can do a blockade on America quite easily if you're Britain in that sort of period. So you don't need X1 for that sort of scenario. What you need X1 for? Well, if you're going to be doing commerce raiding on anyone, it's probably Japan, because let's be honest, in the 1920s, that's the third largest navy in the world. But again, maybe not. Maybe you'll be doing it on France or other nations, or maybe they'll be doing it to you. Either way, the best way to work it out is to actually play around a bit and see what happens. So they build this. It's armed with two twin 5.2 inch guns. That's 132 centimeter guns. I mean, 132 millimeter guns. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> Thank you, narrator. There is a book on it. This one. And it's it's a pretty cool design. It's got a uh, one inch thick pressure hull, is roughly 19 feet or six meters in diameter amidships, and was divided into 10 watertight compartments. She was, her internal hull was almost completely surrounded by an external hull, which also contained the main ballast tanks and most of her fuel. Her intended maximum diving depth was 500 feet, that's 150 meters but was reduced to, well, 350 feet or 110 meters once in service. Neva turrets armored. And let's be honest, they have a range of 16,000 yards. In which case, there are destroyers which can outrange her. They carried 100 rounds per gun. And the ammunition hoists were... How would I put this politely? The ammunition hoist 
were erratic at best. In fact, it's rare they actually manage to maintain full pace of operations that they were supposed to. In fact, six rounds per gun per minute was almost never achieved. And when it was achieved, it was achieved by cheating. Uh, John Barrett, I'm surprised there's none of the old French pre dreadnought. No, this is quirky, not disastrous. I'm sorry, there's no one to, that delivers pizza to where I live. That's both a market opportunity and a distressing thing. Even in the wilds of Cornwall, I can usually get a pizza delivered. Chinese, no, but pizza, yes. I'm not talking about Domino's or uh, Papa John's or Pizza Hut or anything like that. I'm talking the local pizzeria. <sighs> mm-hmm. Uh, nice to Didn't HMS M1 sinking off the cruise, kill off the cruiser like submarine the RM? What if the RM, if HMS M1 hadn't sunk? Oh, her sinking didn't kill it off. Her actual serving killed it off. Honestly, the RN played around with this ship and were going, She was scrapped in 1936. She was placed in reserve in 1930. And in 1930, her commanding officer wrote about her. Internal arrangements not very satisfactory because of over overcrowding with auxiliary machinery. Accommodation is cramped, ventilation poor, and the ship suffers from humidity. Diving arrangements good. That's about it. She had good diving arrangements. The main auxiliary engines were so troublesome she spent most of her life under repair. And then they started trying to build the M-Class. And we won't get into the M-Class because that just gets even worse. Andrew Rapport, the Grillo service showed them as a bad idea. Two got sent to the attack polar, had to be scuttled the next morning by their crews lest they be destroyed. A third got destroyed, the fourth was abandoned. Hmm. I lost that up. Half of US trade was with the British Empire before World War II. So the Iron would not exactly have much commerce left to raid. Pretty much. They're just no, commerce raiding and a war against the Americans just doesn't feature really. It's a distant blockade by just going, you're not trading with them. And the other European powers going, but we want to. And the British going, you send merchant ships past our ports headed for them. They won't come back again. Thomas Barkson's only. I always wondered how they sealed the turret rings or gun house in the circuit. It's not like you can put caps like on gun barrels. It's, um. Let's put it this way interesting. And the dive condition was actually quite good. And then we have the Lexington class. Now, why are they here? Why are they considered quirky? Well. You might notice that the pictures rather do emphasize a certain factor about them. Yes, it's their 8-inch guns. And yes, we can consider them useful, not useful, depending on your perspective. But for goodness sake, the US Navy was sticking 8-inch guns on freaking everything at this point. <laughs> they are obsessed with the 8-inch gun. And you look at them and you go, well... If you're firing to starboard, fine. But if you're firing to port, ouch.
the point is with these eight inch guns and the reason the Royal Navy finds them especially quite interesting, because at certain points they do have their own ships with guns and they sort of get rid of them quite quickly, is the policy is if you've got an enemy cruiser or anything enemy ship getting in range at which those 8-inch guns are useful, something has gone dramatically wrong, and that's a lot of deck space used up for 8-inch guns, and a lot of ammunition space used up for storing ammunition and spare parts and crew to keep them going. But for the Americans, they felt it made sense. It's principally because the Lexington class, rather as in their battle cruiser form or their battleship or their aircraft carrier form, were going to be operating with their eight-inch cruisers as fast reconnaissance assets. They were going to be part of a fast fleet, forward moving, you know, finding the enemy, and having eight-inch guns instead of such a ship was felt to make sense because it was felt that you might run into Japanese cruisers and one of your own cruisers might not be there, so you need to be able to fight them off. Which, in the time when you didn't really rely on your aircraft yet for delivering a knockout blow, a carrier carrying 8-inch guns is kind of a clue that you really don't trust your carriers, your aircraft. <laughs> That's good. The magazine ammunition hoists are more often, uh, more more often than not, a chain of men passing shells along from the magazine to the turret, like a bucket chain from well to far to a far, uh, to an extent. Cannon rate. How would an X one have gone up against a German World War Two armed auxiliary cruiser like Comoran or in a surface action? It would have been dead in seconds. Um, it basically it's limited to its torpedoes become its principal weapon in that scenario. <laughs> Hello, retail fox, retail fox. Just student, I missed the. <laughs> yeah, we all missed the buffet from Pizza Hut. I seem to remember there was some logical reason for everyone trying out cruise submarines like Exxon. But I can't remember what it was. The idea was that, you know, you can't carry that many torpedoes as they're massive. You can fit a far, uh, carry far more ammunition if it's guns than torpedoes in a limited space. And therefore, you could use them to take out down merchant ships and save the torpedoes for enemy warships, was the idea. Do you see Lexington at Matapan? Definitely stay in battle in the Moral Orders. Yep. Lexington at Matapan might well have destroyed one of the cruisers herself. They are technically dual purpose, but let's be honest. 18 JA guns in the 1920s and 30s were interesting. And these guns weren't practically dual purpose. I think. Were they planned to be dual purpose and not dual purpose? Let me remind myself. Let me check myself. Um. They're Mark 9s. Maximum elevation of 41 degrees. So, no. Uh, but they, ha I thought they had been planned for a dual purpose. I'm not sure. Might be wrong. I'm not sure what's the least. But no, it, they're just... How do I put this politely? It's a case of... Well, you've got your reason. In reality, if they're out scouting, 
and you don't have a cruiser nearby to protect your carrier against the enemy cruisers which might get through, you're probably in trouble because even if your 8-inch guns are engaging the enemy cruiser, their torpedoes certainly are engaging you. That's just not good. I believe the SS class carriers also had blast or effect problems when, they, when their 5 inch guns were firing across the flight deck. Yes, they did. Royal Router, you're perfectly right. Vision, Lexington's 8 inch guns better than the broadside 6 inch guns of Graf Zeppelin. Honestly, I would prefer not to have either. I'd prefer to have more 5 inch or 4.5 inch. You know, I'm quite happy with those guns. They are far better for what an aircraft carrier needs. Red Tail Fox. I wonder if the Australia, if Australia had anything that would be considered quirky. Maybe back in the pre Federation days when every state had its own anything. Then you had a lot, Australia had a lot of quirky ships. That's what I was thinking. You need only a single four-inch gun to take out an unarmed merchant ship. Hmm. That is all right. Good diving arrangements. Servicing arrangements have something uh, somewhat to be leave somewhat to be desired. Uh, the X one there was a lot not said. I think in that write up. But I'm fairly sure the various submarine commanders knew what they knew what was going on and knew what he meant when he said it. Vision, the 8-inch guns were replaced in World 2 with 5-inch 38 cal uh, dual-purpose twin mounts. And we can all be very thankful for that. Although, I'm still not sure why they didn't put in a treble 5 uh, a design a treble 5-inch. Why well, I don't want twin mounts, because, you know, they could have fitted them there. It's an 8-inch going down to a 5-inch. But I suppose it would have taken time and then been having your own individual gun, but it still would have been fun because a triple five inch mount would have been well, once you develop a triple five inch, let's be honest, you're gonna start using it on things. Excuse me, I'm just turning off the heater. Oh, it came on and with everything else for going. Why am I starting to feel tired? It's lovely and warm in here. Oh, that's why. Very warm in here. <clears throat> what I love most, I have to admit, is this little picture, which shows both the battle cruiser variant and the carrier variant of the design, and it shows the various, you know, chief of uh, the. It shows Rear Admiral David Taylor. Uh, the chief of then chief of the Bureau of Construction and Repair and Rear Admiral John K. Robinson, chief of the Bureau of Engineering, holding the battle cruiser above the model of the proposed conversion to an aircraft carrier, and you know them being very Rear Admiral-ish in it. And you sit there and go, it hasn't changed, does it? The world doesn't change. And from those, and before we do Sukov, I'm going to expand this just a bit more. Okay, I'd like everyone to guess from the line at the back, uh, the not the two men holding the ship up, but the people in line back. I want you to guess which one is Rear Admiral Moffat, Chief of the Bureau of Aeronautics.
I know it's a quite a small picture, but have a look. Which one do you think it is? Is it the guy staring daggers at the two rear admirals holding holding them up? Or one of the three gentlemen who looks intrigued and enthralled in this new ship? One, I guess. Do you why did Italian's twin 18-inch turret guns so close together? Hmm. Well, in this case, the Lexington's are fairly close together. Uh, depends how you design your turret. Now, if you look at the photos, the double inch 38 cannons take up the space of the twin 8 inch guns. I know that, they, yes, they do take up space, but actually, you've got a far bigger turret ring for the 8 inch guns than you need for the 5 inch 38s. So you could, as said, start at the troll. But, yes, it is easier to just pick the 5 inch 38 off the turrets off the production line and just switch them in. Second left, one on the right. Little guy, second left. Little guy, second left. Cloak one slash. Rear arm muffled is the second from the left. You are right. Second from the left. The one staring daggers at everyone. The one who looks like he would willingly grab both the other rear admirals, one in each hand, neck, each one's neck in each hand, and squeeze is Rear Admiral Moffat, and I'm told that was him looking pleased with them at the new design. So, goodness knows what he said to them in private. John Luke, I do hope Atrius Ron will be on your list. Probably not. Not Rodney. Um, again, she's not really a quirky ship. And other navies do follow them, and he's a battleship. Which quite a lot of navies have. And also a lot of navies have aircraft carriers they actually build with 8-inch guns. And the point is about this is, again... It's not like Courageous or Glory, uh, Cor uh, Furious, where she just had the gun left on her because that was what she'd been originally built with. No, they go and find 8-inch guns and put them on her. It could be worse. They could have tried to stick a 16-inch gun on her. No, grab one neck in each hand. <laughs> I'm fairly sure what he's planning. <laughs> yes, it is the one with all the grey hair. He's a cool guy, Moffat. It's a shame he dies. Right then. Because I, I have no idea why the British try X1 and then they go to the M series and the French do this. The circle. I just. France, why do you do this? 
if you're thinking, this looks like a terrible hull for underwater operations, it is! At one point, an officer, a captain on Zirkov, actually complained that she was, and this is, was his terminology, irregularly buoyant. In that sometimes she would stink starboard side first, sometimes port side first, sometimes she'd go down by the bow. And sometimes she'd go down by the stern, in that the stern would submerge before the bow did. She, at no point in her career, ever seems to have submerged normally. And when I say normally, I mean it's a case of sea level, top of the submarine, not very high above it, and the whole thing goes down. No, she does that, 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 that. Sometimes weird combinations of a lot. One particularly fun time apparently was when she went down on a starboard list, starboard aft list. So she actually sits in the water like that and sit there and go. And that's before we get into all the fun of her design. Before we get into the fun of, she's got the guns. They have problems throughout her career in terms of keeping water out. And let's be honest, the main issue with the, the they'd solved the problem, okay? The reason why X1 had so much difficulty with firing her guns was because she had all these pressure chambers. Along the, you know, to, uh, along the sort of delivery system, which made it difficult for things to go through because there are all sorts of doors. No, no. The French come with a different uh, solution to this one. No, no, no. They make the entire space of the turret its own pressured area. So if water gets in there, it's fine. It just fills up the turret space. That's no wonder the British decided to make two G3 class, decided not to make two G3 class carry conversions. Guess the two Guerrillas and Furious showed how much of a bad idea it was. And it definitely showed how difficult it was. Let's take a moment. Why did Furious have 12 planes left in Glorious and Courageous? Simple, is it? Really? Furious was a slightly different design, and more importantly, Courageous and Glorious, they did a whole a lower rebuild and built it up so that her their um smoke and funnel gases went up through funnels, which went up the top and up through an island structure. Whereas Furious had them, um, well, at various points running along inside the hangar and going out over the aft. Because she was a flat top, whereas Courageous and Glorious had islands. <laughs> Secretary Grant, I thought the M class predated the X1. Uh, let's see. The M class are built. Well, how do I put this? The M class are in service 1920 to 1932. And they have various modifications on them. Uh, the X1 is 1926. And.
So yeah, the M class sort of predate and also come after her. In that they get modified as time goes on, and it's the M class is fun. Anuk, Moffat died in an air cra airship crash. Yes. Weird place to put screws on a submarine. It's... Look, let's just be honest. This whole design is just... It's just... I'm not sure how to describe it. I honestly don't really know how to describe this design. It's it's unique. It's a Surkov. And there's also part of me which wants to ask everyone involved in her design and construction exactly how much wine they were having at lunch. Because I realise it's legal in France. This is according to the Grand Tour and another program I've watched, so I haven't done actually any research myself. To have wine in the office and drink it, and, well, I'd like to know how much was being consumed and which particular vin uh, vintage and vineyard it came from, so I understand the amount of alcohol being consumed. Strike 6136. Ah, Surkov. My spirit animal. animal. Useless, overpowered, and eventually sinking. Hmm. Don't Scott, if the stern goes down first, won't the screws be trying to push up out of the water again? Well, now you have one of the interesting scenarios for you. What does this tell us about the French Navy? Well, it tells us that they're still trying to innovate, but it also tells us that they're desperate for something. They're desperate for that edge still. The fact is they'd thrown all their efforts into the Juna Col. That hadn't worked. Then they started building what would be called pre-dreadnoughts. And by the time they really got those started up and running and production line, Everyone else has started dreadnoughts. And now, in the interwar years, what are they doing? They have a role. Protect the French Empire. Trouble is, the French Empire is neither as big nor as maritime as the British Empire. And the uh, other problem is, for the French, is that they have a massive land border in Europe and they have quite aggressive powers, and it's not far from them. Especially even in the 1930s, they have Italy, Spain, and Germany to worry about. You can sort of understand them trying to go for a different approach in naval terms, which the Surkov is certainly a different approach.
<laughs> Vision. How's the novel in a summary by Douglas Freeman? It's a Douglas Freeman novel. It's fairly decent. <laughs> uh, there are lots of various ideas on what the French were actually on in the chat. Um, could the, the, the Circos turret rotate even a bit? Well, let me this, this way. Here are some technical challenges. Okay. Due to the low height of the range of finder above the water, the practical range of fire was 13,000 yards with the range finder. If they used the periscope, they could increase that to, to 17,000 yards, which, if we remember the X1, is not that great. Um... The duration between the order to surface and firing the first round was 3 minutes and 35 seconds. Um, the turret could be moved. If you're going to fire a broadside, though, you have to remember that once you've surfaced, you then have to deal with all the things which are in built into the turret to waterproof it and then rotate it and this will add a lot more time to the three minutes and 35 seconds so um in practice it's better to surface facing the target even then if we consider your range is about the same as a royal navy destroyers if you're at 3 minutes and 35 seconds and you were against, let's say, a... I'm not even going for a tribal class destroyer, a Kemp, HMS Kempenfelt, you would probably be dealing with, conservatively, 40 to 45 rounds of 4.7 ammunition hitting in your proximate area. Even considering giving them a 1 in 5 hit rate, that's probably going to be between 8 and 9 rounds hitting you. In which case, Surkov is going to be no more. More appropriately, if we consider a likelihood of a sloop, that's about 3 to 4, uh, well, 3 to 4, 4 inch or, uh, guns. All Which are probably also, get, with a standard rate of fire, going to get... Uh, in three minutes, let's see, each gun firing 18 rounds. Let's say it takes them a while to notice you. So again, you end up with 40 to 45 rounds. That ship, that vote is sunk if you're against anything which has remotely the ability to fire at you. She could only fire when she was precisely in the middle of the pitch and the roll, so she, when she was precisely level. If she fired when she was pitching too much, I so when she was precisely level, she could fire. If she fired when she was pitching forward, she would go out of the water. When If she was fired when she was pitching off, that could cause her to flood herself. If she was rolling, well... If she fired when she was on a downward roll, the violent motion could cause her to rock, which would, hurt, well, probably kill pretty much everyone inside her. But if she fired when she was on the upward roll, it was theorized that she could actually flip herself over, i.e. capsize. The turret couldn't be tra couldn't be turned if the ship was ever rolling greater than eight degrees or more, and she couldn't fire accurately at night. And the magazine only carried fourteen rounds for each gun. Uh, 
Uh, John Luke, Dr. C, maybe the designers were operating on the maximum of ancient Persian generals. If it's a good idea when you are drunk, it's still a good idea when you're sober. It's a good idea. Mm, I'm not sure. That's what I think. Uh, the Sukhov had anti-ship missiles like sticks or something. It could have worked. No. It couldn't. It, uh, not even that would fix it. Man is 640. I am so sorry for hearing that one, but finally you've got your pizza. You you, you had to do a 10 mile drive to do. It sent it to the wrong store. That's just rude for the app. So, that's good. I still maintain a Deutschland class with a fantastic merchant convoy escort. Good endurance, excellent acceleration, and big guns big enough to make raiders reconsider. Yeah, they just won't build us up. And a Zerp Squad, mm, designed for Navy Nova Convoys to protect, pretty much. Thomas uh, Baloney, a 13,000 yards range fighter. May as well be throwing potatoes at the enemy as, uh, as the O'Bannon did. Probably. Con Cameron, I was in Waterstones today and asked out of curiosity if they had your book. I was already have a copy, and they said they could not even order it. Yeah, will it be in bookshops eventually? I don't know. It depends if they it they have to talk to Pen and Sword, and I'll find out that way. I do know the online ordering is doing quite well. Yeah, number seven, twenty-eight rounds. That's fourteen salvos total load ammunition. Yeah, all that for twenty-eight rounds. She couldn't fire accurately. I'm like, well, yeah, there is a debate as to whether she could fire accurately at all, but we'll leave it on one side. Magda, since she needed three and a half minutes on the surface before she could fire, how long did it take for a sub with a conventional deck gun to get ready to, to fire after the surfacing? Seconds. We're talking less than a minute. <laughs> not a wolf. Note to self, do not, don't eat during Sirkov descriptions. The firing description hurt. It, it hurt me. Honestly, there are far better ways to um, go than serving on the Sirkov. Mishran, it seems like a deck-mounted six-inch gun was the most useful weapon for a submarine like the USS Nautilus. I would go for a deck-mounted four-inch, but okay. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Is it Um, Let's see. It's, it is a terrible idea and done very badly. Hmm. There is certainly something interesting about this vessel. You really want to know the the, the post Sirkov careers of people who push for this thing to be built? If there's any sense of justice that Richard Creel was in designing garbage barges? Yeah, no. Nice one. Yeah, crew get up on deck, open the ready use ammunition locker while other crew is ready in the gun for action. As I said, it's very quick normally. So the Deutschen class. The Deutschen class. Okay, so. You always have to remember these are built to replace pre dreadnoughts. That the German Navy was allowed to retain post World War I as part of their status. And honestly, 
I think it was more designed as a bit of an insult than anything, but it allowed the Germans to maintain this and to say, we need to replace them now. And this is what we're going to replace them with. And everyone went, okay, fine. That doesn't really bother anyone. And it didn't. Because there's a reason it doesn't really bother anyone. It's got 11-inch guns, because that's the biggest gun the German Navy could, at that point, maintain and build. It has... Well... It has a standard load of roughly 10,800 tons, which, again, no one's really going to bother about too much. Its length is 186 meters, beam 20.69 meters, and draft 7.25 meters. It had 53,260 shaft horsepower, supplied by eight man diesel engines. And they drove two shafts. Top speed, 26 knots. So it wasn't going to outrun anything the Royal Navy had. Now, before you start going, well, really? Here is the point. Have I got my picture of Rodney? Rodney, Ron. yeah. So, the point for the Royal Navy, whenever they are considering these ships and whenever we're sort of we're talking about them, is a very simple one. We all know that officially. These ships were able to do 23 knots. We also know that at several points in World War II, though a ship at the front, which is Rodney, was recorded at doing roughly 26 knots. That could do 26 knots as its top speed, and it theoretically could maintain it quite well, apart from in rough seas, when it usually chucks down, and especially as it's lighter, a lot quicker than something which is heavier. So in heavy seas, the odds are, actually, this ship could outrun that one, even if it is top speed really was 23 knots, not slightly more. Simple put, if a Deutschland had been caught like Neisenau was caught, that would have never got away. That would have destroyed it. And this is the reality. What is it built for? Is it built as a commerce radar? Well, it has the range, but not the speed. Built for convoy protection? What's it, what convoy is it going to protect? Start to realise very quickly the Deutschland class are built to try and keep up the skills of the German Navy. And you can understand that. They had to try and keep the yards going, to keep all the, uh, keep all the skills they need going. But there's a problem. They're honestly not very good. They are heavy cruisers. And I know this is a term I use a lot, but they are heavy cruisers in terms of the guns they're fitted, because that's the other option. That's the realistic option. If you had wanted to be, again, in the Washington Naval Treaty, if you wanted to be cruel to Germany, you could limit them to heavy cruisers of 11-inch guns. And you could have said everyone's allowed a credit cruiser of up to 15,000 or 20,000 tons. This is coming from the county class videos which I've got going on. And gone, their maximum gun they can have is an 11-inch gun. The really interesting scenario is then you could have actually got the Royal Navy building 11-inch gun armed heavy cruisers and going, <laughs> but we'll leave that to one side. 
the reality is this is a ship which is designed around those two big triple turrets and it's an out of date design when it's built because it's got a single turret forward and a single turret aft you know the first thing you'd have done is go right then so if I'm going to cheat and get it to 10,800 tons, I might as well go a few hundred tons more. I might as well stick either a third treble 11 inch turret in or stick both turrets forward. So she's got all six able to fire forward. And that gives me that. And then maybe I stick secondary armament aft. Uh, I could. There are so many things you could do with a Deutschland class to actually make them a viable, sensible ship. And the first thing is get a bit more speed. And you could have done that by... And I, I'm honest about this. If you consider the space to keep the ammunition at its te correct temperature, you've got all the engines in the middle, and then you've got all sorts of space used for insulation to keep those two separate magazines fine. You might as well arrange this Dunkirk style with the two turrets forward and all the magazine space forward, and then you've got all sorts of more space. It's a very inefficient design. And yeah, it basically just shows an inefficient navy. That's good. Replace the triple elevens with a pair of twin eights each. And you've got a relatively decent heavy cruiser. Yeah. So remember, I thought they were more as a flagship designs. They had to replace the pre-dreadnoughts, which were flagships at that time. But honestly, nah, these aren't flagships. Come on, I had not realized before, until seeing this plan view, but they do look like they are going backwards with what could be the narrow bow, uh, narrow bow being the stern. They certainly do look like they are re you know, sort of reverse design. He... Yeah, the, the, the stern does seem sort of lengthened versus the bow. The Deutschlands actually start off before the Nazis get anywhere near power. This is the point about the Deutschlands. They start, they're being built in 1929. They're being designed in 1927, 1928. So they're relatively old ships in, comp in, the rest, in comparison to other German heavy major units. Deutschland is laid down in 1929, commissioned 1933. Admiral Scheer laid down in 1931, commissioned in 1934. Graf Spee laid down in 1932, commissioned in 1936. Deutschland, of course, becomes the Lutzau. Because the Germans, well, Hitler especially, has a panic attack when he realizes the Royal Navy could sink Germany.
Um, they are on the cruisers. Well, they're, they're, there are three of them, for starters. Nice second. Grass Bay currently lies on a side of stern blow off and the aft turret has fallen off. Hmm. The Royal Router. Were there any other designs being considered for the Deutschlands? There was actually an interesting other design. If I just quickly go back to that before starting on the Goshland, which is rather an interesting story in of itself. But. The Germans had plans for another ship. If I can get this one to serve up. And this would have been an interesting vessel to have. Well, it would have been. This is the D-Class. Or, alternatively, the second generation of Panzer Chief. And this is someone's CG rendering of the design. But they were supposed to be 20,000 tons in displacement. They had a top speed of 29 knots. Still not that massively fast, but a lot faster than the uh, their predecessors. They carried again the six 11-inch guns. They had eight 5.9-inch guns. Those twin turrets, you see. Um, eight 4.1-inch AA guns. Some of the other twin turrets you see, the sort of diamond formation twin turrets, if you see them. And a far better belt. They actually were going to be steam turbine powered. With some region of 123,000 shaft horsepower. And they show some of the thinking. But the reality is the design and construction of these ships is superseded by the Shan Horse class. Generally, the problem with both turrets forward is you have nothing that can shoot while you're running away. Well, then you just keep wafting from side to side, or you run away at a slight angle, seeing fire over your shoulder. Anna, is it arrogance that the United States, USN have both the USSS, United States, and the USS America at one time? Um, I wouldn't say it's arrogance, but I'd say it's setting yourself up for an issue. Entry report. Considering the rationale behind renaming the Deutschland to Lutzau, how much of a morale blow would it have been, especially considering HMS Britannia sunk 1918 and US America sunk 2005? Um... I think America, when she was sunk, was scuttled after a live testing, and now there is another USS America, which is an LHD. So that's a different scenario. That's you sinking it yourself. Um, Britannia... That wasn't fun, but it would have been more of an issue for a dictatorship than a democracy. Especially a dictatorship which was talking about itself being the Thousand Year Reich. If the Royal Navy sink Germany, there's a problem with that. Hmm. 
Hmm. Now, the Gotland, which is one of my favorites on this list. She is technically a seaplane cruiser. She would carry six Hawker Osprey seaplanes. She had a capacity of eight. And they did try and purchase two more. But that was unsuccessful as the production of, the, of that aircraft type had ceased. What's worse, it was found that the aircraft were found to um, suffer from wave damage during rough weather. In World War II, the uh, Gotland sighted Bismarck when it broke out over the uh, broke out of the Baltic Sea. This sighting was reported to Swedish Navy headquarters, and the message was intercepted by the British Embassy. And that, of course, tr is what triggered the Battle of the Denmark Strait and the Allied chase of the Bismarck. Uh, in 1944, she's converted to an anti-aircraft cruiser due to the lack of modern seaplanes. This involved the removal of the seaplane, an addition of four 40mm Beaufort guns, and two 20mm L70 guns. The Ospreys continuing in service from harbour bases and not being retired till 1947. After 1947, she served as a trading ship. She carried six six inch guns. In two twin, in, uh, two twin turrets and two single turrets. She carried, as originally built, 475mm, that's 3 inch guns, 425mm, 0.98 inches, and then later the other guns are added. She also had six, torpedo, uh, six 21 inch torpedo tubes and the ability to carry mines. Top speed 27.5 knots. Complement. With aircraft aboard would be five hundred and twenty-seven. With just without the aircraft aboard, it goes down to four hundred and sixty-seven. And she's a cute design. She is really. Generally, not the same scale, but if the RNS sunk a German name sh a ship named, Ber named the Berlin, not good. Generally, more a problem for dictatorships than democracy. Yes, remember, dictatorships often have to sell themselves as being strong and powerful. So, therefore, the, for them, image matters more. Whereas democracy, to an extent, the democratic system itself buffets you to the fact that there are going to sometimes be failures. There are sometimes going to be issues. Dictatorships are all about, are often about image, and actually, there are it can get worse in certain cultures. Um, it would seem to have more of a problem for dictatorships in terms of image than others. For example, you could argue that in Germany, in Germany, the image was far more important than in Russia. Whereas in Russia they were uh, they chose they had the dictatorship not free choice, but to extent the public had accepted the dictatorship because of quite how bad the Tsar's rule had been, especially in the various vagaries of the system in the latter years of their rule, and then the civil war and all those things. So to extent the public support for the dictatorship was based on it's better than our other options because they didn't really understand there were other options, or rather didn't really have enough of them. One standing on hope that there could be other options. Whereas in Germany, well, they've had the Kaiser, the Weimar Republic, and then they have Nazi, uh, not uh, Nazism and dictatorship, and 
that means that dictatorship has to strive even more hard to try and maintain its face and its status. That's why Hitler is so obsessed with not with not losing his ships. Because every big ship that gets sunk is a major loss. Not in material, because let's be honest, for the Germans, a navy is a bonus. It's not a war fighting tool. You know, they're an land army. They're fighting a massive war against the Soviet Union. Honestly, any money they're spending on navy is off the route of March. But, you know, submarines you can argue for because they're trying to st they're trying to starve Britain, and the rest is to help make that more of a you know, not sort of British being able to focus in straight on one threat. But the reality is. You, if you don't use the battleships, they're even more pointless. And he doesn't want to use the battleships because losing them is a big loss of face. You know, he, he, he stops battleships, he stops all surface ships, large surface ships going out because a couple of cruisers, including Lutzow and Hipper, I think it is, have a fight with Royal Navy destroyers and get beaten up. They come across a convoy and they think, Woohoo! We're going to get a convoy! And there is a rather large group of Royal Navy destroyers which go, Hello! Welcome to the party! This is called the Thunderdome! And the Germans are going, Um... Your destroyers you're supposed to get out of our way were big heavy cruisers. We don't hear you! We're too busy firing our guns and trying to sight our torpedoes on you! Yum's going, you're insane! Yes, and we're coming straight for you. Uh, it, 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 it goes on for quite a while like that, and eventually when heavy units turn up, the Germans basically go, ah, good, we have a reason to withdraw, we're going away. They're insane, these English, they're nuts. What do they feed their destroyer crews? And Autumn, you'll never show, but are we going to get into the US IGN and some of their interesting ideas? Yes, we are, but I thought you'd like a Swedish one for a bit of a variety. Don't Scott, and Russian history can be summarized by the phrase, and then it got worse. True. <laughs> Uh, report. To add to the point of it being a larger problem with dictatorships, there may also be the fact that Britannia uh, that Britannia was one of the 70-odd battleships. Deutschland would have been one of eight large ships. Mm -hmm. So they feed the destroyer crews iron brew, potentially. Um, I I'm still waiting for Drax to vid on the Battle of the Barren Sea. That will be a good one. The Barren Sea is a very interesting battle. Ah. <laughs> uh. Red tail, red tail fox. Damn it, I thought it was safe to take a mouthful of soda. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Clark. Thank you now. Well, you know, they're clean. It's a simple thing. <laughs> it, 
it, it, it's the whole point is this, and there is actually a logical process to the destroyer crew's actions in World War Two, and the Italian Navy gets as well the same, which is why some of the ba most interesting battles are those of Italian destroyers versus Royal Navy destroyers, and they get really, really bitter battles. If you are lightly armed, lightly armoured, and you are facing a bigger opponent, then your only chance of survival li uh, lies in manoeuvre. And if you're going to manoeuvre and dodge, you might as well manoeuvre and dodge towards the enemy, than away from it, because it's simple. The thing that can really take you out is their big turrets, their big guns. And if you are closer, if you're far away, and you move that distance, the gun only has to move a little bit to track you, so it can keep up with you. But you dodge closer, and I've got to build and move more and more and more to get close. And you're, of course, the closer you get, the more you're likely to get into torpedo range. And I don't want to get into torpedo range, because if you get into torpedo range, you can really sink me. So, going aggressive is actually the safest course of action for a destroyer crew. And um, Taffy Free exemplified this, the Royal Navy's destroyer crew, I've talked to you many times, it's going to this. Um, the German destroyer crews are a mixture. Some of them get this, some of them don't. It really does depend on the quality of leadership on the German destroyer crews. <laughs> it's 1640, so a few destroyers are some incapacitating turbots. I think they did give her a bit of damage. I'm not sure, though. I'm trying to remember that one. Um... Thomas Malski, there were quite many, and there were quite a few, uh, many interesting classes. Sometimes one ship class is one those. I wonder, for example, about Thai ships, including those which are ordered in Italy and never finished. Hmm. Royal Ritter, I have an off topic question. What is Iron Brew? I'm American and never before heard of drink. Is it a type of beer? No, it's a type of soft drink. Um, Iron Brew is a soft drink. It's not a beer. It's basically the Scottish version of Coca Cola. But it doesn't taste anything like Coca-Cola, and it's bright orange. Now, this and absinthe, along with whiskey, are the three of the main products which seem to come out of Scotland. Um, only one of those is a soft drink, but believe it or not, Iron Brew is not considered the weakest of the three. In fact... Most whiskies go down softer and are less likely to to cause you to uh, do random things than Iron Brew. <laughs> so, here is the tone class. Now, so... The reason I haven't done much on the Japanese is because I've done an entire video on the heavy cruisers of the Japanese, and really it's the, the heavy cruisers which really do show this to the Japanese. But I couldn't not bring it up. Now, the Tone class are cool ships. They are really cool ships. They're also a really terrible design. And I say they're a really terrible design because if you're going to make the front that long anyway... Why, in the name of all things holy, do you make B turret the super firing one? Thank you, narrator, for becoming a supporter. Thank you know why you are now blocking C and D turret from being able to fire. If you're doing it this long anyway, you might as well make it go A B C D. So that D is the super firing one, firing over all the other three, and that allows C and B to B and C to fire over A. At least a bit. It gives you a bit of a forward firing arc. Or alternatively, you make them all flat. You make them all on the same level. In which case you don't have the weight of it super firing, you don't have the top weight issues and all the extra things that can bring it. 
and you still have the broadside if that's what you really want. If really what you want is a broadside, go for it. Now, the whole point for these is that the Japanese were starting to get worried about the pace of a future war. You have to remember their plans, and I've been through their plans and doctrine in other videos, and please go and look at them, the various plans of, uh, you know, the various plans I've talked about. It's basically any of videos about more than decisive battle. And the point of this, the point of the Tony class, is to provide reconnaissance for the fleets. The idea is with their seaplanes, they can spot the Americans coming a long way off. And this means you, A, don't have to have your carriers as far forward, so you can bring them in. And B, you also don't have, your carriers can concentrate on delivering that big strike. Because remember, both the Americans and the Japanese looking at fighting the Pacific Theater correctly worked out for the Pacific Theater that the advantage goes to whoever, who, whoever hits first. And the odds are, if you hit for uh, whoever hits first and hits largest, is likely to win the fight. Especially if it's a daylight battle, which is what both seem to be thinking about for their carrier aviation. Now, the point is, again, for most of them, is that for much of the 1920s, they have a far smaller carrier arm than the Royal Navy's fleet air arm, and a small, in terms of numbers of aircraft carriers which means the Royal Navy manages to build up experience, which is why the Royal Navy goes to night flying, again, because Jutland is prepared to put in the money, the time, and the risk, the personnel, and you do lose personnel training for night flying, so that, you know, they end up with the night flying motif, and which is where they come with the constant rhythm of strikes, and that their carriers are designed around, which is their difference. Both the British and the Americans prefer to do reconnaissance from their aircraft carriers, though, than, other, than leave it to other ships. However, the British also do have the town class cruisers. Now, the interesting thing about the town class cruisers is they are light cruisers, and of course, their turrets are not all gathered forward and all their aviation aft. So it's actually a slightly less efficient design, you could argue, than the Tony class, which has all the firepower forward and all the aircraft ammunition aft. But the difference is the town class, doesn't, you could argue, are built the way they are because storing the aircraft centrally is because the aircraft are there for if they're operating solo, not for if they're operating really as part of a group. They are not supposed to do the reconnaissance for the whole fleet. If they are doing reconnaissance for the fleet, then that means the carrier is either loading up for a heavy strike or something else has gone wrong. They are a backup, secondary reconnaissance asset in terms of fleet operations, they are a primary reconnaissance asset in terms of their own operations, and the same for much of the cruisers. The other role for the aircraft is to act as spotters for their own uh, for their own motherships firing to make sure they're getting aligned up. And again, you can use carrier aircraft for this, but by this point, the Royal Navy has decided that, frankly, carrier aircraft being used for that is a waste of carrier aircraft. If you need a spotter, carry it yourself, and that's what the why the battleships have spotter have aircraft, and why the heavy cruisers have aircraft. Often, it's the spotter aircraft. It's also the reconnaissance duty is for the counter-surface rating. Or surface rating, depending on what they're doing. Tony class, are, of course, aren't surface raiders. They are built entirely with the idea that what happens if we don't get those land bases up and running? What happens if the slower sleep plane carriers, support ships, don't manage to get forward to the various island bases they're supposed to be setting up on, and we need forward reconnaissance? Well, here you go. Here's the Tony class. Now... Myself, I think, frankly, the Japanese would be better off with more of an 8-inch cruiser. But it's because they're worried about the information. And why are they worried about the information and then they're pushing for this? Well, because they have a smaller fleet. They know they have a smaller fleet than the Americans. They know there's no rapid build-up, nothing they can do which can make up the gap. So they need as much information on any attack, American attack as possible. So they can probably position themselves to intercept it perfectly. If you are off attacking what you think is the main enemy attack and it turns out to be a feint, 
because you don't have enough reconnaissance aircraft to spot the difference between the feint and the main attack, then it, it's it, your limited number of ships uh, and the handicap that gives you is made even worse. So this is what the Japanese are worried about. They were worried about information gathering, and this shows you explain, com explains completely their design. Now, later in the war, they, of course, also convert an aircraft, uh, uh, convert battleships into these sort of things, and that basically just shows desperation, because by the time you need that, you're in trouble. Oliel, Iron Brew, the drink that outsells every fizzy drink in the UK bar Coke and Pepsi. To an extent, yes. Thank you, narrator. Peter Dawson, a HMS Spitfire was good for close range combat. What was the best weapon against that? A. Guns. B. Torp. C. Captain Sword. D. Chopsticks. Probably the Captain Sword. Chopsticks might not do much against her. Angela Rapport, read the turret arrangement of the Tony class. I did read somewhere that the pyramid arrangement for free turrets was optimal for heavier guns, a similar to Nelson Tokyo class. Yes, there is an argument for that, but it provides the most condensed space for armour. But if you're already building a ship of that design, why? So, Abdiel class. Now, I'm going to answer the rest of the question of the Tony class, but I just want to say this. This is basically the RN going... How fast do you think we can make a ship if we really want to? I always had this set of mental image that when they were designing the Abdiel class, Henderson walked in the room to Goodall and said something along the lines of, I bet you can't design a cruiser which can do 40 knots. To which Goodall went, I bet I can. I bet you can't. And carry, and carry 156 mines. I, I, I bet I can. I bet you can't. And this is what evolved. And as Ollie L says, I hear Jeremy Clarkson was the reason the ideal class was built. After all speed, no. Power! These things had 72,000 shaft horsepower. Basically, this is also... Uh, this is... How do I put this? Um, okay. A few years ago on Top Gear, I think it was Jeremy Clarkson said, the recipe for speed is add lightness and power. So basically, you take a town-class cruiser, you leave the engines alone, and you cut it down and everything you don't need off the ship. And you end up with something which is around about two-thirds of the... Uh, around about a third of the weight. So the power-to-weight ratio goes... three to one... Uh, goes up by three, a factor of three to one. And yeah, you get something fast.
But basically, if we go back to the tenor class, and the thing is, by the time you need a battleship converted into a half carrier, with the ability to launch some fighters, you're probably already in a situation where the world has gone very, very bad for you. It's not something you set out to build. And really, this isn't something you set out to build sensibly. Sensibly, what the Japanese would have done is take some fast ocean, uh, build some fast ocean liners that could be rapidly converted to, on a few months' notice, two flight decks, length, a length, a full length flight, a flight decks, and small hangar spaces. Let's say the ability to carry eighteen to twenty aircraft and range and speed, and use them, and then have some decent eight-inch cruisers with. The armor and various other things built into them that you need to escort them. That would have been the more sensible. And again, it goes back to the fact that the Japanese are prepared to cheat, but they don't cheat well enough. If you're going to cheat, cheat properly. Steve Windish, um, the town class, etc. example I was using, stuck the float planes in a hangar. They didn't tend to be jettisoned or, or, or they burned the ship up. It did happen to both the UK and the US at various points, but usually they launched them. Interesting, the Admirals needed flames painted down the flanks. I do think if they'd been painted bright red, they would have gone even faster. Seneca, is the story about the Manxman overhauling a U.S. carrier battle group in the Suez Crisis true? Yes. Hi, Henry Miller. Thomas Valentin, I wonder what would have happened if someone thought of putting 212,000 sharp horsepower of the Iowas into an Abdeel. Uh, that thing might have taken off. That might have taken off. I don't know if they've got the space for that much for, uh, horsepower. <laughs> oh, thank you, uh, uh, Bijan. I'll look at that on Twitter and later when I finish tonight. Joshi, was there a story that the deal ran out around a couple of destroyers going max pad themselves at 40 knots plus knots? Yes. Outran a few tribal class destroyers on a couple of operations. And basically, the Abdeel class, once it put its men, if it was in open water and put its pedal to the metal, there wasn't anything which could really keep up with it. And honestly, Sean Quigley, I know you're joking, but. I would love to see Vin Diesel captaining an Abdeel class because it would be about the only ocean-going ship which could keep, which could do enough speed for him. And the entire point of this was to lay a minefield. Now, Derp's got to say, lay an entire minefield outside a new port. Yes, it could do that. But think of it more from the Royal Navy's perspective of the Far East. Their plan was, and if they had been built in time, you would have probably seen one or two probably deployed to the Far East. They would have mined the approaches into the South China Sea before any Japanese task force could reach them. That was the idea. If they were operating from Singapore and you had enough notice, which they probably would have done, they could have sent them out and dropped mines. And yes, they've got quite a heavy AA armament. They may get in, they may not. One of the other things they do, do a good job of is actually being AA cruisers. They're actually fairly decent AA cruisers when they want to be. And interesting enough, a couple of them are actually lost in the wartime doing that role. Pretty much. Manxman is named for the Isle of Man. Manxman is someone who comes from the Isle of Man. This would be Manx if you, if you come from the Isle of Man.
Thank you. So with quirky, what quirky ships should would an independent India need? An independent India need, independent India need in Model One plus two to compete with Japan and satisfy the strategic situation. It would probably want something like an Abdeel class, because then it could block off the Singapore Straits and keep them out until they were ready. And it probably wants some carriers and some uh, carriers, cruisers, probably a battleship or two. Um, they could have done. They'd have needed to work on the infrastructure and their yards. So, okay, do the modern outboard motors go faster than their deals? Uh, there are some of them which go pretty darn fast and probably slightly faster, but. Let's be honest, none of the ones that go faster are 4,000 tons fully loaded. And carrying 156 mines and six four inch guns in, uh, in, quick, in twi three twin quick firing mounts and several 40mm guns and have armour. And that report, 212,000 shaft horsepower, assuming the same displacement, which isn't technically possible, gives a top speed of about 57 knots. If it was done realistic, the ideal class would have hit 50-ish knots. Probably. Although these were 40-plus knot ships. Stanley Goodall did a really good job on the ideal class. They are really well-designed class. And they are really quite scary for a lot of how do I put this? The Abdeals being around gave the uh, a, a few of uh, the Axis powers a very false impression of the speed of Royal Navy cruisers. Kenray, are there any museum ships that can be visited today that we consider quirky? Um, most of them are fine examples of what they were normally built for, but M33 is probably quirky. HMS Unicorn is quirky, uh, to an extent. She's an old wooden frigate. She can go and look around. But, um, yeah, I, 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 M33 Monitor is a, definitely a quirky one, and um, I always love to go up to... You can go if you go up to the Tyne and Weir archives, or the Tyne, which is also in the Tyne Weir Museum. You will find Turbina there, the first ship to be fitted with a turbine, and the ship which was used to go around the um, Queen Victoria Spithead Review and basically go, "Look, this is what turbines can do as a sales technique." So, if you, it, it, that's always fun to go and have a look at. <laughs> Demasa Balaconia, uh, would you say the ideals are the fastest ships above destroyer size built before the 1950s? Definitely, judging by the accounts and descriptions of them, yes, they were. And honestly, I think it's a shame we didn't keep building something like them. I haven't seen any footage of it, any footage myself, but I'm not. That's not not saying there isn't. There is always some weird stuff turning up in places, and it's worthwhile going and hunting it. They are very, very fast and very good looking ships. HMS Unicorn. Because she is quirky, because she's a forward aviation support ship. She might look like an aircraft carrier to some people, but she's a forward aviation support ship. And the only navy which really builds them is the Royal Navy, because the Royal Navy is looking at going operating around the other side of the world. 
and she's ordered in April 1939. So well before World War II begins. And it kind of shows you the reality of the British not being sure whether war is going to start in Europe or Far East first and needing to prepare for both. Because, as I've said before, in January 1939, you had the Tsingtao incident, where you very nearly have war. And in September 1939, of course, we end up going to war in Europe. But the British have to build because they aren't at war, but they think war is coming and could come in either one, as if they're preparing for both, which is why you have unicorn orders. You know, the treaty has been over since 1937. The naval treaties have been defunct since then. Ordering Unicorn is a forward aviation support ship. The Royal Navy could, in many ways, get away without, without say, could have just said they're ordering a light fleet carrier, but they're not. And they're honestly not ordering a light fleet carrier. It is capable of running in a light fleet carrier configuration, do that role, and it is the basis for the light fleet carriers in terms of its design. But it isn't a light fleet carrier. It is a forward aviation support ship. And it's all designed around making things like the illustrious class and even Ark Royal more efficient because it means if they're operating in the Pacific or if they're operating in the South China Sea far away from the UK, then you could have your aircraft store at Singapore or in Trincomalee in Ceylon, in Ceylon or Sri Lanka, as we call it today, or back in Australia. And this ship will be doing the circuits between there and then, uh, those places with the stores and supplies and spare aircraft and new uh, new pilots and the aircraft if they need them, and bring them back to the fleet at sea. This is one of the points I make when people start going, well, you know, the British weren't considering or weren't thinking about fighting a fleet at sea and supporting a fleet at sea. They're building this. Yes, they're not building any new fast fleet, any, any new fast fleet tankers because they've got some in service. They want some more ones, but they, they're they not building them yet because they think they've got time. They're building this. And if you consider when she laid down, she laid down in June 1939. Now, she's completed in 1943 because she is also held up by Churchill's we must slow down, we, uh, we can't produce these things. You know, oh, we don't need capital ships, I'm going to pause capital ships and carry conduction. But, honestly, there is no reason she couldn't have been launched in 1940 instead of 1941. And she could probably have been completed by 1941, if not maybe late 1941, early 1942. And if you plan a think of a war in starting in 1942, if she'd have been in service, she'd have been in service before that, which would have been very useful. Pete Dawson, Hydroforce, we'll be getting to those. Don Freeman, with HMS Victorious becoming USS Robin, would a loaned ideal class become USS Roadrunner, or was this all before Wiley Coyote cartoons? Not sure on the cartoons, but that's a rather nice... If you imagine, if you were doing a fiction book on World War II, and you called it Robin and Roadrunner, and it was, a, let's say, Victorious and one an ideal class went out to the Pacific, that'd be ra as a pair... That would be quite cool. And general report, didn't the Japanese believe Unicorn was 45,000 to 50,000 ton supercarrier? The Japanese had so many different ideas about what Unicorn was really, was really going to be.
Death Squad, I read a sing time to Am I right in thinking the merchant ship was probably smuggling weapons of the Chinese nationalists? Well, that's certainly what the Japanese would would suggest, but the odds are far more likely it was trading alcohol and other things. It's going to sound strange. Weapons, if they had found weapons, and remember they do do a full search of the ship and etc. If they had found weapons or trace of weapons, they would have made a big stink about it. They could never find anything. So the odds are she was just evading Japanese customs and going to evade, with, uh, so she was just trading directly with the Chinese and was probably doing normal run-of-the-mill stuff because then that wouldn't get her into as much trouble. Because, oh, I just didn't, I, I, I just went to where I normally drop off ships, uh, these things, which is there. So, okay, what do you think about a free ship class with names in the United States, America, and USA? I would say that so that would be uh, ordained by a president who's compensating for something. Hello, uh, there's a Foxo. This good. That our crew is really good at smuggling weapons. Mm, yeah, it's quite difficult to find a, a track everywhere in the ship, but yeah. Well, the other we've got Robin, so perhaps Unicorn, uh, perhaps the Abdeel would be called Batman. No, that's probably still a bit early for that. So probably Bugs Bunny or Mary Medley start in 1951. Hmm, there's isn't it? <sighs> Ah, uh, did it? Uh, characters: Looney Tune, Mary. There was one who was pretty quick in the characters. I remember. I, I, I don't know why I'm getting distracted by this. I probably am, but um, yeah. Ah, uh, didn't appear till 1954, that one. Oh. Wiley Coyote, uh, first appearance, Fast and the Furious, 1949. Dang, blast it. Hmm. We'll see. Mm. That's a good one. Unicorn had to do Light Fleet after Hermes sank, because Hermes was half Light Fleet, and 1942 carriers hadn't started building. Yeah, pretty much. She had to do Hermes roll, Eagles to an extent. She picked them up both. Uh, picked them both. She offer also operated as a flagship for a whole load of escort carriers at several points. Speedy Gonzales, uh, 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 Speedy Gonzales, perhaps USS Speedy, Robin and Speedy. Hmm. Ah, and now we're up to the Pegasus class. Now, they're kind of an interesting one.
And probably the fastest vessels... Well, how do I put this politely? It's kind of interesting uh, what people have just said, because these vessels could... Can theoretically do 48 knots foilborne, so... Theoretically, all that money put into the foils could only get them eight more knots. Theoretically. They're an interesting design of ship. They were fast attack ships, and they're intent originally intended for operation in the North Sea and Baltic Sea. However, the US Navy was trying to do a joint development with various, well, other navies, especially the German, uh, the Germans, the Royal Navy, and the Canadian for uh, Canadians as well. And the idea was to field a NATO, basically fast attack craft, in the North Sea and Baltic. However, when Zumwalt retires, the rest of the US Navy doesn't like this design. And they basically, the US Navy does its old trick, which is it can funnel money. Once it's got the money, it funnels it using various emergency procedures from the project it's assigned to, to the project they want it to go to. And it's only when Congress forces the US Navy to complete the ships that they're actually finished and built. They are, of course, armed with eight harpoon surface-to-surface -surface missiles and a 76mm Otto Malera 62 cal gun, which possibly reflects the Italian involvement in their design and the German involvement in the design. The original idea had been to order 30 for the USN, 10 for West Germany, 4 for Italy, and they thought they might then get another uh, second order from Italy and a second order from Germany and a, an order from the UK and possibly an order from Canada. There was actually at one point a theorised that there would be 80 equipping NATO forces with the US Navy fielding about 40 of them. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because, honestly, most of the world is sort of looking at them going, what can we use these for? And at a not too dissimilar time, as this was being conceived, uh, the Royal Navy did actually build an HMS Speedy, but the Royal Navy, uh, the uh, the Royal Canadian Navy, actually made uh, built HMCS Bras de Or. Now, Braster Ore is an interesting vessel, and I'm going to get her up as well to basically give you a nice thing to consider. This is Braster Ore. Now, she's a hydrofoil that serves from 1968 to 1971 in the Canadian Forces. And she's theoretically an anti-submarine warfare hydrofoil. But she never has carried any armament, and she's there for trials. Despite ex exhibiting extraordinary stability in rough weather, and frequently more than 40 knots, uh, stable at 40 knots, more, uh, frequently more stable at 40 knots than a conventional ship at 18 knots, and actually exceeding 63 knots on trials, uh, possibly making the Brast or the fastest warship ever built, although officially that title lies with the scrolled corvettes, which can do more than uh, do 60 knots when fully equipped, um, and actually do carry weapons. The Canadian Navy didn't go with it. It's ultimately, it's one of those interesting things, the hydrofoil concept. It has so many good ideas, it seems, and everyone's always going, yes, this is the future, and it never turns out to be the future. 
And it's one of the, those sort of lessons I like to sort of explain to people. I go, you know, be careful of people predicting the future based on what's cool. Because Hydrofalls are very cool. Look at these ships. The Pegasus class are super cool. Their ship, beautiful. The reality, hmm. Hand Dutchman. Dirt Squad. Uh, smuggling a bit of booze and tobacco might be a good color for smuggling guns. If they're acting oddly, of course, it's just then smuggling booze and tobacco. Hmm. Yeah. You're overthinking things a bit, but on the level. Anna, lead ship has metric dimensions. Remaining ships are five ships English. Hmm. Uh, now, six hundred. The Pegasus class Hydrofoil served the role as missile boats in the Ace Combat 4, 5, and X video game. Hmm. Now, six hundred. Why did the US Navy not, the UK not buy the Pegasus class Hydrofoils? They didn't see the point in them. They honestly fought for the North Sea. This is going to sound strange, but the Royal Navy is looking at going. Um, if I want to launch some missiles at ships in the North Sea, I've got this thing called the RAF. Or alternatively, I'll call, I don't know, have a submarine there. If I spend money on the Pegasus class, that means I can't afford a lot of other things, and I want those other things. In the defense, it's basically Zumwalt trying to turn the US Navy into the Arsenal democracy thing. It works for him. To an extent. But he doesn't have a very good legacy that way, and it's almost appropriate that he'll be turning up again his name at least. I just heard something go bump outside my door. So I'm going to quickly go check it. If you've been up to no good again, Mr. Foxy, you and I can have a conversation. Especially if you're trapped down there. It's only to block you. I don't know. Seriously, that fox is insane. At some point, I'm going to have to really try and make them think about that one. Anyway. Back. Sorry about that. The fox is really, really insane in my area. Would Pegasus have been useful in the Persian Gulf? I don't think it would been that useful in the Persian Gulf myself. And as they, as Kevin Ray says, Eosin doesn't seem to like small combatants. Not really that good at them either since World War Two. They had some really good ones in World War Two. Since then, they've not really got good at them. Uh, 
Dan Freeman, according to Wikipedia, the comic book character Robin first appeared in 1940. Well, the USS Robin is, of course, the aircraft carrier. Is, of course, the aircraft carrier. So they could have made the cruiser USS Batman. Take care, Rattel Fox. <laughs> uh, the Freedom Class Literal supposedly can do 47 knots. Anyone know if they really can? Um, there are lots of arguments on that one. Uh, Juicy Student, how well do hydrofoils work in heavy sea suits? They look like great ideas in calm sea, but in North Atlantic, does a storm or any help? Depends on the design of hydrofoils. Some are done better in uh, in rough sea states and others. Sure, right. is this the case of maybe coming up with something that they can do to get funding, regardless if another branch can do it better and cheaper? Pretty much. Right. So, the Kirovs. And people are going to go, well, it's quirky about the Kirovs. Well, here's the thing. Why does no one else build a supersized ship? Let's be honest. The Kirovs are built at the height of the Cold War. They're built... In between 1974 and 1998. In simple terms, they're built at a time at which the Americans will literally, anything the, the Soviets build, the Americans will immediately turn around and go, we can build bigger and better than you and we'll try and do it. But they don't. Why? Because ultimately, the Kirovs are a symptom of a navy which is expecting it to be a very bloody and very quick war at sea. An aircraft carrier, as if, if you listen to Bill Trump's podcast, you'll know, can be rearmed at sea. You can resupply it, reload the air, and load up the aircraft, and it can keep operating. VLS, you can't really rearm at sea. You had some options during the Cold War, but they weren't really great, and they were only for really Mark 41 VLS and then the smaller missile ranges in that Mark 41 VLS, not the bigger ones. Uh, it was not really good to do, try and do it at sea. You cannot rearm a Kirov class at sea. In many ways, you can argue they're not supposed to be rearmed, because the idea is they have enough firepower to get them to the firing point, and then they launch all their big missiles from the firing point at the American carrier fleet, and then if they get home, great, you rearm them, you do it again. If they don't, well, let's hope they took out the US carrier strike group. They are quirky. They're not a terrible design, they're not a bad design, they're a good design. But They are built from a very specific perspective. And it becomes even more specific perspective when you get to see them tag teaming up with Kiev class and later Kuznetsov style aircraft carriers. Because then you have the aircraft carriers part of the force to get this ship in range with its very, very large amount of firepower. Hmm. 
Oh, the Karen. Uh, that would work a dumb meaning as they would have. Uh, then we still have. Uh, you still had Batman, military service officers in the RAF and for, for higher ranking army officers. Yep. Hmm. So, Scott, I thought they were still building the Kirovs. Um, they're not technically building the Kirovs anymore, but one is undergoing refit. They only still have, if I'm not mistaken, two left in service. Um, they have Nakimov is undergoing refit, and Pito Veliki is in service with Northern Fleet. Uh... Admiral Fyota Sovetsko Soyuz Kumletsov is was cancelled in October 1990, and Kirov is due to be scrapped. Was due to be scrapped last year, and apparently Lazarev or Fruns um, commenced its scrapping in 2021. So, okay, your sister has no pictures in her Kingston online appearance. That doesn't surprise me. My sister doesn't like pictures. Just think, what's quirky about the Kirovs? They still afloat. They are still afloat. There's two of them still in service. Well, one in refit and one in service. Noted Wolf. So it's a direct reversal of the USN or UK CV carrier battle group. The carrier is expendable rather than essential, right? To an extent, yes. I would, there's an interesting debate of that. The upgraded, modernized Kirovs, let's be honest, the Peter Veliki and the Nakanov presumably will have a similar fit when it's finished. Uh, the Peter Veliki currently has 20 anti granite anti ship missiles. Hang on. Yeah. 20 granite anti ship missiles. Hang on, oh, was that is that the original one or the uh, the current one? Cash stands. That's the original one, isn't it? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, twenty granite anti ship missiles. Um, sixty four. Uh, SA nine Kinsale surface to missiles. Forty eight S three hundred M four M surface to air missiles. Forty eight S three hundred F fort uh, surface to air missiles, and a whole lot of other stuff. They are heavily armed. And they're being upgraded. They are having the latest in terms of missile systems, the latest in terms of capabilities fitted on them. In 2021, she's went to sea with 10 other warships, including Marshal Ustinov, um, another, I think, of the uh, very large vessels that the Russian Navy is maintaining. And in June, she took part in a 20-ship strong exercise. It's The thing is, it's a status. It's named after Peter the Great. And now, and it has a lot of status in the, in the Russian Navy and with the Russian people. And I'm fairly certain if you decided you were going to get rid of them, you would get into a lot of trouble.
the reconstruction of the uh, Nakimov is due to be finished in 2021 and she like Peter Vilecki which apparently also been upgraded to these will have Calibre missiles, cruise missiles, and S-400 navalized version of that fitted and all sorts of things. Again, it's a lot of firepower. And as Carl Gosman pointed out, refit Kirovs carry between 40 and 80 Zircons and Calipers. Yep. They're fun. Anyway, Visby class. Now, I could have put the Skull class here, but I like the Visby class better. Because they're cute. And the Visby class are cute. Let's be honest. And it's one of the interesting things that... I think if the Americans had pushed for something more like the Visby class than the Pegasus, they'd have probably actually got more people buying. And look, do they need to sail with ocean tugs, just in case? Um, the Kirovs are nuclear-powered, and they tend to do okay without the ocean tugs. But probably they have a good contract going on nearby. Yeah, let's be honest, these are the Swedish hotness. The fact is, though, I wish the Swedish Navy had built a few more of them. They were originally supposed to have six, but they built five and, and cancelled one. And I think that was a sad thing. I think having a sixth would have been good. Um, I can't pronounce any of their names other than Visby. Um, Heisingborg, Heisingborg, Hanasand, Nikoping, Karlstad, and Udavelia. Udavala um, is the one which wasn't completed. Which meant that the fourth naval warfare flotilla only got two ships, whereas the third got three. Which I felt seemed wrong to me. It would have been better to build six. It would have been even better to build nine and have to activate another naval warfare flotilla, but you know, that's just me. The original hangar that was planned was considered to be too cramped and was removed. And like for instance, on design phase, and one of the things I find interesting there was I, I would have thought they could have put a telescopic hangar to come out and protect the aircraft from the elements to an extent to just basically give you slightly more options or slightly more utility from aircraft, but I can understand why they didn't. Hmm. I should point out I am out of liquid now, so um, if I am sounding funny, it's because my throat's drying up. But they are cool ships, and I have at least one more ship to go. What do they tell you about the Swedish Navy? They tell you pretty much that it's planning on fighting close Sweden. But it's also planning on dominating what it's fighting. It's got a 57mm Bofors. It's got eight anti-ship missiles. It's got um, four very large torpedo launchers. They, they carry 400mm torpedoes. Let's be honest, 400mm torpedoes are big.
They're not 18 inch torpedoes. But they're still 16 inch. That's still a decent sized torpedo. Not the biggest, but decent sized. And if you're talking about something which is in the waters in the Baltic, a 400mm torpedo, mm -hmm, that's probably going to cause trouble. Now, they also have a 127mm rocket-powered anti-submarine warfare grenade launchers. That was cool. My and capability of carrying both mines and depth charges. And provision for, but not fitted with, two times two, sex, two pull, 127mm anti submarine rocket launchers. They carry a single one rather than um, a sex two pull mount, I think. I think that's what they said. Notes. And of course, they don't carry their SAMs, so their surface to air missiles. Because, honestly, the theory was they should always be operating under a neutral sky and air defense will be in range, and 12 missiles won't do much apart from take up space. Especially as their whole purpose is to be stealth to try and avoid air attack, and this was made the pre really the upgrades we've had in thermal imaging, which has come out of arguably out of the experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, which has really led to a development, an increase in thermal imaging and IRS infrared scanning, tra and scanning and tracking systems in the West. And if I think if some of that technology had been available at that point, they might have gone with it because Earth could have offered you, offered you a passive means of sighting short-range surface dome missiles. They might end up going back for those. They might. Ferenc, do you agree the pajama class Corvette is underarmed with only one eight inch uh, eight cell Mark Ford one VLS of two possible eight S anti ship missiles and no CRS? Uh, it does sound a little bit on that way, doesn't it? So, should we consider how quickly can you fit the second eight cell? Um, and are you ca you're probably carrying it loaded with quad packed with surface to air missiles, but again, that's only going to be thirty two. So I better have 64. Have you seen re re Visby names? You're just reading from the IKEA catalog. Don't be that cruel. Pete Dawson, 16 inch equals 406.4 millimeters. So 15.75 AV equals 400 millimeters. It's close enough to 16 inches. Okay, I do realize it's 25.4 millimeters per inch. But I was doing some quick maths in my head. And today's final in the quirkies, and this is the interesting one, is the Zumok class. Which someone said a, a modern coastal battleship. On well, a Zumok class as envisaged with the advanced gun system, not the railgun system, would have been a versatile strike combatant that you could have used to attack enemy land positions, etc. And extend the range of your strike group, but more importantly, take some of the pressure off your SSGNs and multiply the enemy's problems. As they are now, and as they are likely to be with hypersonic missiles put in, they are probably going to continue to be to fulfill that role. But ultimately, 
the reason that they've become quirky is because instead of keep building them and modifying and improving the design, the US Navy went, uh, we tried to fit everything to them and it didn't work. They turned them into technological Christmas trees. And in many ways, I would argue the Zumont class epitomizes more of the problems in the US Navy than the LCS. Reason is, the LCS is, as we all know, not a very good hull with everything crammed into it, and the modular system hasn't worked, and the hull doesn't have the zinc anides and all the various other things which are protected, to protect it and all these things. And it's not really, it's, it's the ship which is bad, not the concept. With the Zumok class, the ship is very good. That hull has turned out to be excellent. The power plant, superb. Everything else in it, great. The Mark 53 VLS, that's working fine. The only problem with it was the railgun system. And because the railgun system didn't work, and someone decided to save money by not investing in the AGS system, which was supposed to be the system which had been originally designed for, and then the railgun would be put in place, they cancelled the procurement. And they went, oh, it's terrible. So the good design that was let down by some of the Christmas tree stuff they were tangling onto it, but which you could have found a replacement for without much, too much funding and could have made it into a very good design, was cancelled. But the bad design, which has got all sorts of issues, they kept building. And people go, oh yes, but they cost so much for the three of them. Well, that's because the entire program was designed and built around you building a lot more than three of them. So the program cost is designed and divided by three hulls and all sorts of things, which were set up based on you building a lot more than three hulls. And really, the other solution would have been to go, budge, these guns aren't working. Okay, we'll turn one into an AGS system, and the other one will fill with Mark 41 VLS, or will fill for hypersonics. Which is what they're actually now doing. They're filling them with hypersonics. So it would have been great to have these ships in service in more of them because, again, they have the hull space for hypersonics. They're upgradable. You're going to have to go back to a lot of drawing boards to, or probably just end up reinventing this class and restarting this class, which is going to be very expensive in a variation of this class, though it won't be called as a Maltz Mark II or Batch II or whatever. It'll be called something different to get to sort out and provide a suitable ship for carrying hypersonics and this class would have been useful for the USN they need something which isn't a full carrier group but is bigger than an LCS that is impressive when it turns up and the trouble is the Ali Burks are too overworked the LCS was supposed to relieve that it, they aren't going to the Constellation class will relieve it, but they're a long time away. So the other option you could have had for present ships would have been a squadron or two of Zumwalt's to turn up and go, hello. The fact is also the Zumwalt's with very little modification. You could have filled out those spaces with Mark 41 VLS, and you could have turned them into your cruiser replacements for your Ticos. Because let's be honest, the Zumwalt is better than a Tico, space-wise. So, you know, it, it's a case of this was a design, whereas the LCS is a design which no matter how much effort they haven't been able to make really work as it was planned. They have, they've got good crews in there. They're trying their best. They have a great esprit de corps, and they're really trying to get the best they can out of our ships, but they are, I wouldn't say polish, uh, uh, polishing muck, but they are, you know, varnishing plywood. Plywood's perfectly good wood, but no matter how much you varnish it, you never really get that good a finish. It'll never look as good as a nice piece of oak or a nice piece of cedar. But the point is, they're trying their best. Whereas this was a good, solid piece of oak, but it had some weird dangly plastic bit of plastic legs. 
So basically, take the legs off it and put a, uh, put some nice wooden legs on it, and you've got a great table. Karen, when on Bill Trump's be back? We're recording the first episode of, se uh, se uh, of the third year or season three next week. You shouldn't. They look like a French pre-dreadnought. Um, you're just going because of the round down hull at the end. Yes, I do understand why you say they look like a French pre-dreadnought, but they're a lot better than a French pre-dreadnought. Should the RN or Royal Australian Navy also take over the Zumwalt's? Both either can better handle a small class like that. Honestly, if you gave the Zumwalt's to the Australians, goodness knows what they do with them. I, I, I could honestly imagine some very, very scared people dealing with the Australians running a Zumwalt. Henry, could should Zumwalt's be a 2.0 be a kind of a mini curl? It could certainly have a similar amount of missiles. And look, your ship design procurement has been multi level disasters since the Navy shipyard stopped being building ships. Mm, yeah, there have been issues. Desert Fox, where do you watch Bilge Pumps? Bilge Pumps is mine, Drax, and uh, Jamie from Armored Carrier's podcast, which we do for Simsex. So you can find it on Apple download, and I think you can you can find it on where you normally upload it to uh, Simplecast. There are lots of people in the US procurement department who need a whack around the air. Vision, and now talk turns back to plywood. We cannot escape IKEA today. <laughs> Right then, so that's the quirky ships for today. I haven't done all the variations on quirky ships I can do because honestly, I wanted it to be roughly three hours long, but also, and this is more important, I wanted to leave something for another video another day because I thought quirky ships is something we could return to. And I just thought I would give you an idea of why I'm calling this the cruiser year. Yes, I'm calling the cruiser year for a reason. Now, I've been enjoying the response to the counties, and I've been enjoying, I've recorded quite a lot of them already, and I've been enjoying the response to the other things that are going on. So I thought, well, with it being 2022, which is 100 years since the Washington Naval Treaty, and 100 years since they started having to deal with cruisers like this. And it being, well, since the beginning of the Treaty Cruiser era, and it being also the year where we're starting to really consider what the realities of Type 83 is going to be, it'd be worthwhile doing a year of cruisers. So, as you can see, I have lined up a year of cruiser long patrols. In that the first and second long patrol of every month, pretty much uh, for up until November, are cruiser themed. They are going to be the Kent class county series, which are going to be coming up in the first week of every month until May. 
and then in Ju from June onwards, it's going to be the U.S. Treaty cruiser in, in cruisers in war and retrospect. As you can see, uh, for the second week of the month, we've got some basically falling on for the ideal clock. We have some mine sweep uh, mine lane cruisers. The Nautilus class, the Kaiserlijk Marine, the Pluton of the uh, Marine Nationale, uh, Brummer class, Koinsberg class, and then the Leipzig class. And then we've got start on some Italian cruisers, the Amaral Mar Mergescu of the Romanian Navy. And then it's Gisania class of the Regia Marina, the Leida class, uh, Cardona class of the Regia Marina, uh, the Ramona Montagheli class of the Regia Marina, the Duca de Ostagosta class of the Regia Marina, the Duca de Absurdi class of the Regia Marina, and the Capitani Romani class of the Regia Marina. It should be fun. And I'm going to be adding in probably a whole lot of other long patrols as I go. So I hope you enjoy what's coming up. But because I've got this coming up, I have delayed. I am not going to start the vote for brew ships till Sunday. So that means you've got till Sunday if you want to upload and more ideas for Patreon and suggestions for the brew ships. And this means I needed another new idea for the live next week. So the live next week is going to be principles and factors of cruiser design. Yes, I thought we could do a live discussing all the ideas and all the issues which go into cruiser design. I also thought you'd like the idea, the fact that on the 8th, on the 3rd of February, we've got the Battle of Dieu from 1509, which is going to be a cool one to look at. Thank you, Kim Ray. Carlos, also, reasonable. also, please compare the crew needs to, say, Burks. Yeah, the Zumwalt's you could do with a lot, even fewer crew than they actually have. They have systems in place which could allow them to have far fewer crew than they actually operate with. And they already operate less than Burks. John Shea, Zumwalt, good idea, original plan, with AGS, decent plan. But bad, bad management doing it following plan. True. Hmm. Interesting. Japanese government announced yesterday they would build their own rail guns for missile defense. If they get rail guns working for missile defense, then the the Chinese would be very, very worried because there goes their numerical advantage of, you know, being able to build a lot of missiles and guarantee getting it to hit through. There's a Voxo. Are the Kirovs and Zumwalt's comparable, given that they are relatively large and are out of ordinary ships who don't have contemporaries and other navies? Mm, to a lesser and greater extent, depending on what specific aspect of them you're discussing. The quirky ship's uh, long patrol will come out on Saturday. I will add that then. I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but it's going to be on uh, Saturday. Would like something on the French treaty cruisers. They look interesting designs, but surprisingly not weird in French. Well, I'm going to see how quickly I manage to record. Um, it's going to sound strange to the counties, especially, because I might carry on with Pluton from February and make the third week, uh, the long patrol, the third week of every month, a French treaty cruiser and then do some other treaty cruisers from around the world. Uh, at the end of the year to fill in the slots, but I'll, I'll see what it's like. Cargoes, considering cruiser design principles from like 1800, uh, 1880, I was going to start from about 1880. What happened and what the different ideas went through into cruisers and what they were for. That's what I'm thinking. Is this some weird variant of the Chinese calendar? The year of the battleship? The year of the destroyer? The year of the cruiser? Mm, that would be a cool year. A cool thing. This is the year of the cruiser. Next year may be the year of the aircraft carrier. Last year was arguably the year of the destroyer. But it could soon become the year of the frigate. Or maybe the sloop. Possibly the corvette. 
Then there's the ship of the line, a year of the ship of the line. We could uh, do an entire variation of a what we call a naval astral calendar. Were you born in the year of the destroyer or the year of the cruiser? That could be fun. Uh, Mitchell Oates, to be honest, the USN on submarines, they have had all the steel issues recently, so maybe. As Dan Freeman's point out, yeah. Come, Cameron, is it the if it's the year of the cruises, will you be going over Belfast to a tour on HMS Caroline? I'm hoping to visit this year. If I have my way, this year I'd like to visit HMS Warrior and do a recording on her. I'd like to do a recording on HMS on cut on the Cuddy Sark, mainly to compare the construction techniques used in the 1860s, and I'd like to do Caroline and Belfast. I doubt I will get all four, but that's my target. It's going to the. This always sounds terrible to say, but it's literally it's going to depend on time and finances. If I have the money, if the book sells well, if I continue to have very nice super chats from all of you and patron continues to do well and all those continue to do well and memberships continue to grow on the channel and the number of people watching the channel goes up and it, especially if it breaks the 10,000 mark, then I'll have enough money and I'll be able to go do the, uh, do the research and do the visits. But I also want to do some research trips for my next book, which I'm writing. Which means I need to go up to Scotland. And I need to do some research up there. I need to do some research in Liverpool and in Newcastle. I need to do some research in Greenwich. And some research in Kew. And some research in Cambridge. And some research in Oxford. So I've got quite a lot of travelling up ahead of me this year. Which is why I'm glad I've got the car I've got now. But also why I am basically going, it's going to be, if I have to prioritize one, and this is going to sound strange, I will prioritize the research trips for the book because I can include those with making some videos. But over the research, tri uh, research trips purely for making videos, because if I can do a two for one, that makes more financial sense than if I have type money and I do the one a, a trip which only does one, a trip to HMS Caroline. There aren't really many archives. Well, I, I, I've got to go have a look at the Harlem Wolf archives, but they seem to be a bit more interesting in access than the ones which are for Camelairs, etc. But basically, it's finances willing or God willing, depending on your perspective, they'll be done. Definitely, Colin Curran, hopefully Dr. Clark will get behind the scenes access on Major Field Forces 2. We'll need a camera crew that happen to also have medical training and be local in London. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it's got, uh, got no plan for super cruisers like Alaska or Sailor. I might well get onto the super cruisers, or as I call them, the real heavy cruisers. Reckless Sada, read today that Australia and Japan signed a defense pact. Does this change anything? No, but there is a part of me which wonders if Japan might end up joining AUKUS. There's a fox, uh, uh, fox, so sloop versus corvette versus frigate. In World War One, two, what's the difference? Oh, that's an entire video. <laughs> yeah, I, I am, I, I am surprised to see that the wall, walls of the pigs, has not come up as a patron suggestion yet, or at least I haven't seen it yet. Uh, considering after the reaction to my last comment of all the various wars of the pigs and people going, what do you mean, there'd be more than one war over pigs? Yes, there have been lots of potential wars over pigs. Pigs have been fought over more often. There are do a Google search for war of the cow. You won't find anything. At least I didn't when I did it. But war of the pig? Yeah, that comes up.
Oh, hang on now. I've just done a search and on French inside out of Wikipedia, there is one. For goodness sake, it lasted six years. Between the Prince Bishopric of Liege and... Seriously, what is it with people having wars over cows and pigs? Well, no, still there's far less wars of the cow. There's only one war of the cow. Possibly two. Two wars of the cow versus roughly six for the... Um, six for the pig wars. The, civili the casualties... Oh, the, 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 the casualties and losses are the, during the Dusseldorf Cow War. Which lasted from June 1651 to December 61. Two civilians killed and a herd of cows taken as prisoners of war. You can take cows as prisoners of war? Sorry. That's just. That, that's what you got Anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I'm going to go and get a drink now. I hope you've had a lovely evening. Take care. Uh, hang on, uh, Trent Lanka, the pig war. You're thinking of the Anglo-American one. There's also the Serbian, uh, Serbian, Austro-Hungarian one, and a few others. There have been lots of wars over pigs. Pigs get fought over. And I thought the emu war was a weird one. That's the only one which the humans have lost. Let's be honest. The pig wars and cows wars, humans usually win, or humans are usually the people fighting on both sides. The emu war, we lost. <laughs> oh, Ryan, a lot of fish walls they're having. Ryan, and sheep, uh, sheep wall. I'm not looking at the sheep walls. That's the Anglo in the English Scottish one. Oh, good lord, that one lasted a long time. Take care, everyone. Thank you, George Newman. Take care, Nautical Wolf. Thank you, Jess P. Uh, Melanie1640, Dan Freeman, Stafford. Sure, Mac, all, all those three, especially for doing that admining. Thank you, George Newman, Rick Sava, Greg Salski, Night6831, DG40, Nautical Wolf, Trent Lenko, thank you. Thank you, Desert Foxo, thank you, Greg Salski, Colin Cameron, Mitchell Oates, Derp Squad, Darius Radatsky, Nautical Wolf, Carl Gasberg, I knew I could be 4472. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ollie L. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you found it fun. Thank you, Mitch Lotes. Thank you, everyone. And should we now start the Holy Order of the Emus. I'm going away before we do start the Holy Order of the Emus. <laughs> That's just scary. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Take care. Thank you, Thomas Balsconi. Thank you, Desert and Foxo. Thank you, everyone. Wrong one.